Welcome to a presentation on the ultrasound findings in the first trimester of a normal pregnancy. In this presentation, we will discuss the indications for first trimester ultrasound screening. Normal female pelvic ultrasound was covered in another presentation, so if you have any questions, please check that out. We will go through the ultrasound findings of the first trimester in order of appearance and speak of them each in detail. There are many indications for a first trimester ultrasound screening. The first trimester is defined as a pregnancy dated fewer than 14 weeks after the last menstrual period. Some indications are confirmation of an intrauterine, meaning inside the uterus pregnancy, evaluation of a suspected ectopic, meaning outside the uterus pregnancy, estimation of gestational age, diagnosis of multiple gestations, confirmation of fetal cardiac activity, and screening for certain genetic disorders. There are two primary methods used during the first trimester prenatal ultrasound. The first is a transvaginal approach, which requires the special endocavity transducer, which is inserted into the vagina. The second is a transabdominal approach, where a transducer is moved superficially across the abdomen. Of these two modalities, the transvaginal approach is preferred because it provides imaging at a higher resolution. The main structures we want to visualize on a first trimester ultrasound are the uterus, cervix, and ovaries. For transvaginal imaging, the endocavity probe is placed in the anterior fornix due to the highly elastic nature of this structure. For more information, please see normal female pelvic ultrasound. Now let's take a look at a transvaginal ultrasound image and briefly try to locate some major structures. For a more in-depth discussion, please refer to the normal female pelvic ultrasound presentation. On the right, we see a hazy outline of the uterus due to the hyperechoic serosa, which is labeled S. We also see the muscular myometrium labeled M as well as the hyperechoic endometrial stripe down the center of the uterus labeled E. The junctional zone of the myometrium is labeled with a J. The fundus of the uterus is labeled with an F. The cervix is visualized in the top right and the pouch of Douglas is labeled PD and is seen immediately posterior to the uterus between the uterus and the rectum. In addition to the uterus and cervix, we also want to visualize the ovaries during our first trimester ultrasound. As a brief reminder, during the follicular phase, 5 to 20 follicles are stimulated simultaneously in response to FSH, although usually only one ovum ovulates. Once ovulation occurs, the remnants of the follicle becomes the corpus luteum, which produces progesterone and estrogen to support the pregnancy until the placenta can take over. On the right, we see arrows pointing to the ovary. Traced in red, we see a hyperechoic thick-walled ring around a hypoechoic center, which is likely the corpus luteum. If we use Doppler imaging, we would likely see a ring of fire indicating hypervascularity around this structure. Now let's move on to the ultrasound findings that we see during the first trimester of a normal pregnancy. The first sign that we see is the intradecidual sac sign at 4.5 weeks, which is shortly followed by the double decidual sac sign at 5 weeks. After that, we are able to see the yolk sac at 5.5 weeks, which we can use to determine if the patient is carrying multiples. At 6 weeks, we can make out the fetal pole or embryo, which will become the fetus, and then we can also measure the crown rump length, which we can use to very accurately predict the gestational age. At seven weeks, we can visualize the amniotic membrane, which holds the amniotic fluid before it later fuses with the chorion around 14 weeks. Let's take a look at each of these findings separately. After ovulation, high levels of progesterone during the luteal phase decidualize the endometrium, preparing it for implantation. The ovum is fertilized in the fallopian tube and becomes a blastocyst during its travel to the endometrial cavity. The blastocyst burrows deep into the decidua, hence the name of the sign. 
intra meaning within, decidual meaning the decidualized endometrium, sac sign. Let's briefly take a deeper dive into the decidua. The decidua is divided into three main categories. First, there's the decidua basalis, which is the region between the blastocyst and the myometrium. Second, there's the decidua capsularis, which is the portion of the endometrium that covers the implanted blastocyst. Finally, there's the decidua peritalis, which is all the remaining decidualized endometrium. Let's take a look at the image. First, there is a centrally hypoechoic dark structure circled in green. This is our gestational sac. Next, let's take a look at the hyperechoic region circled in red. This is our decidua basalis and capsularis. Notice that there is no interruption or widening of the adjacent endometrial stripe, which is shown with the white arrow. This intact endometrium tells us that we're not dealing with endometrial fluid collection, which can sometimes mimic the intradecidual sac sign. As pregnancy progresses a few more days, we are now able to see the double decidual sac sign at five weeks. Looking at the image on the left, which shows the uterus in the long axis, we can see two concentric hyperechoic bands around the gestational sac, as demarcated with the arrows. The outer band is the decidua, or the decidualized endometrium. The inner band is the chorion, which is the outermost membrane surrounding the embryo and will form the fetus facing aspect of the placenta. On the image on the right, which is a transverse view, we can once again see those two concentric hyperechoic bands surrounding our gestational sac. We can see the inner chorion and the outer decidua. This gestational sac also has a yolk sac visible, which we will discuss further in the next slide. Notice our gestational sac is a round, fluid collection with no sharp edges or angles. This is important, so we can exclude a pseudogestational sac, which occurs during an ectopic pregnancy, which is a pregnancy that implants outside the uterus. In a pseudogestational sac, we look for fluid collection with acute angles or a teardrop shape, which represents fluid or blood from the fallopian tubes collecting inside the uterine cavity. As the pregnancy continues for a few more days, the yolk sac becomes visible at 5.5 weeks. The yolk sac is a structure that forms outside the embryo and attaches to the midgut of the embryo via a structure known as the yolk stalk, aka the vitelline duct. The yolk sac nourishes the growing embryo. It is obliterated by weeks 14 to 16 of pregnancy around the end of the first trimester. The presence of a yolk sac definitively confirms an intrauterine pregnancy. The yolk sac can be used as a proxy for how many amniotic sacs are present before the amniotic sacs are visible on ultrasound. On the image on the right, we see two yolk sacs, which means that we are dealing with diamniotic twins. We also see only one chorionic membrane, demarcated by the red arrow, which means that we are dealing with monochorionic twins. Thus, this image shows monochorionic diamniotic twins. Monochorionic diamniotic twins are, by definition, identical twins that have separate amniotic sacs and share a placenta. We see two transverse images from the same uterus. We see two distinct chorionic membranes noted with the red arrows. We also see two distinct yolk sacs as noted by the white arrows. Since the yolk sac is a proxy for the amniotic sac, these would be dichorionic diamniotic twins or twins that have both their own amniotic sac and their own placenta. All fraternal twins are dichorionic diamniotic twins as are 30% of identical twins. A few days later into the pregnancy, we can now visualize the embryo. Note that the embryo is within the amniotic membrane, but the yolk sac is within the chorionic membrane. On the right, we can see an image that uses motion mode, or M mode, displaying cardiac activity of the fetus. Between weeks 6 and 13, we can measure the embryo using the crown rump length. By doing this, we can get an accurate estimation of the gestational age of the embryo. 
In order to do this measurement correctly, we must have a mid-sagittal view of the embryo, and the embryo must not be flexed at the neck. Once we have an image that is appropriate, we can measure the longest length from crown to rump. Finally, as the pregnancy progresses to seven weeks, we can visualize the amniotic membrane. Since the amniotic membrane is so much thinner than the chorionic membrane, it tends to be difficult to see on ultrasound. However, in both of these images, we can see the amnion and the chorion very clearly. As the embryo grows, the amnion will eventually fuse with the chorion at the end of the first trimester, around 14 weeks. This is also the time during which the yolk sac, which is outside the amniotic cavity, will obliterate. In summary, we have discussed the intradecidual sac sign, the double decidual sac sign, yolk sac identification, yolk sac identification to determine multiple gestations, the fetal pole or embryo, and cardiac activity identification, how to take a crown rump length measurement, and how to detect the amniotic membrane. Thank you very much for your attention.